Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kirk Tramble, president of the UC Berkeley Black Engineering and Science Alumni Club. We are a CAA member club. On behalf of BSAC, I welcome you to the COVID-19 Vaccines, Science and Facts and Alumni and Friends virtual panel. Our mission is to improve the opportunities and support for Black Berkeley alumni, students, professors, and staff in engineering and sciences, and to join local UC Berkeley alumni together in organized efforts to benefit the members of the chapter in UC Berkeley. Please be sure to visit our mailing list for more information and our website at http colon slash slash calbesac, C-A-L-B-E-S-A-C-K dot org. The COVID-19 pandemic is one of the few universal challenges that we all face. As we navigate this journey, we face important decisions. Today's discussion includes timely, trustworthy information that will help us navigate our COVID-19 vaccination journey. I'm delighted that you're here, and I hope that today's panel discussion is very helpful for you. Next, we have a message from a Cal alumna from the class of 1976 and Berkeley Law's class of 1979, who received the UC Berkeley Excellence in Service Award at the 2011 Ga Charter Gala, the 2018 California Review Law Review Alumni of the Year Award, and the 2020 Powerful Woman of the Bay Area, Cal Alumni Association's Executive Director, Chloe Hewitt. I feel so privileged to be given the opportunity by the Black Engineering and Science Club, BSAC, I can think of no greater calling during this historic month than to discuss how the COVID vaccinations can make a difference in the lifespan of so many members of the Black community. For far too many of our people have already lost their lives to this deadly virus. When I think of the lives that have been lost, I can't help but remember the words of Quincy Jones in speaking about the tragedy of Tupac, and I quote, if we had lost Oprah Winfrey at 25, we would have lost a relatively unknown local market TV anchor woman. If we had lost Malcolm X at 25, we would have lost a hustler nicknamed Detroit Red. And if I had left the world at 25, we would have lost a big band trumpet player, an aspiring composer, just a sliver of eventual life potential. Members of BSAC and alumni of UC Berkeley, this panel is not only a celebration of Black History Month, this panel is a celebration of life. This panel is about how we ensure that the potential of Black people is fully realized. We wanna be alive to support our next generation of Black leaders. Together, we rise to ensure everyone in our community has access to and receives the COVID vaccine. Thank you very much and go bears. Chloe really touched upon why we're here today and why we think this uh, event is so important and the work that's being done by the panelists, um, especially the community work by Dr. Roberts. Uh, we would just take just one moment of silence uh, to acknowledge both the, um, our local community, the national and the uh, global impact um, in terms of the, the really tragic loss of COVID-19. Okay, thank you. So uh, in terms of the motivation, again, it, there's just the national statistics uh, are quite staggering. Uh, the impact, sorry, it's going the wrong way. Impact uh, on uh, specifically here, focus on the United States. Uh, and you can see in this graph, um, just this was taken around February 2nd when the death toll was around 440,000, as we know now, there was a national remembrance um, when the half million mark was reached. Um, and here you can see that this is impacting uh, across all demographics. And when adjusted for uh, population, um, the impact on uh, communities of color is, is really staggering as well. 
um, where um, Pacific Islanders, uh, the Latino community, indigenous peoples, and the black community are about 2x the rate or 2.4x the rate of uh, people affected. Uh, this is also adjusted for age, which is really critical because especially in the black community, the, the rate of death by age is about a 10 year uh, gap. So the median age for um, white Americans is 44, whereas it's 34 for the black community. So it's, it's a huge impact when age adjusted. And this is again, one of the motivations for our discussion today. Um, also, we wanted to kind of dispel one myth. There is the myth in the, um, throughout the media, especially prevalent um, that black Americans are more likely to be vaccine hesitant. Um, here you can see ranked on this Kaiser Health News poll. Um, it's about, it is a high rate, uh, rate of hesitancy, about 35%. Um, Republicans um, actually have about a 42% hesitancy rate, uh, probably not get or definitely not get. Um, also uh, one thing that I think um, Dr. Roberts work will really address is making sure that um, communities of color feel that the process is really addressing their needs. And you've probably seen nationally that uh, leaders like Dr. Fauci have met uh, with members of the black clergy to try to uh, get vaccines into the black community. So this is really important work. Um, also, just uh, this will be my last <laughs> moment talking and we'll get to the real experts and panelists. We want to dispel the myth of why you cannot have that wait and see attitude a lot of folks are hesitant to see this there, and then they'll say, oh, I'll wait and see how it's working. Actually, most people are in the wait and see pool um, when polled. Um, however, we want to um, kind of uh, dispel people about how that's a real effective strategy. So with that, I'd like to introduce the panelists, uh, and then we'll segue into um, Dr. Satterfield's discussion. So uh, first, uh, Dr. Terrence Satterfield is a uh, Oakland native. Uh, went to Bishop O'Dowd High School. He studied at um, Stanford University in human biology and received his PhD at the University of Washington. Um, he worked for Biomarin Pharmaceutical, uh, working on uh, vascular, neuromuscular, cardiac, and metabolic disease, and joined Mace Therapeutics uh, recently, uh, working on the candidate therapies for therapeutic effects in patients impacted by severe disease. And uh, we welcome Dr. Satterfield as our um, expert in uh, cellular biology. Uh, our second panelist returning from our earlier panel, and as I said, you know, really indebted to her as a catalyst for this, uh, this whole discussion and her work to help with everything on the panel is Candia Brown. She's the Senior Director of Global Market Development at Thermo Fisher. And she's also a, a one of the leads of the JUST project, which is a, a $25 million donation through Thermo Fisher to support COVID-19 testing at HBCUs. Um, and the, the number of HBCUs has been expanded. And this is really uh, an amazing impact into the community nationally. And, and lastly, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Mashika Roberts, uh, she's MD and, and, and uh, as MPH, she's the health commissioner in the city of Columbus. We really welcome her today. Also, she's in the Eastern time zone, so I really appreciate her participation. Um, she's worked uh, as the health commissioner um, running a group of over 500 public health professionals uh, who are focused on neighborhood-based approaches that address the social determinants of health from safe, affordable housing and education to jobs and violent crime in order to decrease the health disparities that exist. Uh, you can think of this as a, a truly holistic approach uh, to health. Um, she's uh, been on both local, uh, regional, I believe national news recently, uh, speaking about the COVID-19 vaccination efforts uh, in and around the city of Columbus. And we're, we're really, um, just indebted to her to spend time with us today and really appreciate that. Um, Dr. Roberts um, um, is also a 92 uh, Cal alumna and um, we're welcome her and to be 
conversation here as an alumna and as an expert in her field. So I will pass the ball to um, Dr. Satterfield and we'll get into some of the, the science and facts around COVID-2 biology, vaccines, and immunity. All right. Um, thank you, Miller. And uh, I'd like to thank BSAC and Miller for, um, for inviting me to speak on um, a topic that is of um, uh, obvious, obvious, uh, tremendous significance to us. Um, I'd, I'd like to start with a little disclaimer. Uh, I am not, uh, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not uh, a COVID expert. Um, I'm not a lot of things, but I am a cell biologist with uh, a lot of experience um, in cell biology. I've worked 14 years doing preclinical research um, in biopharmaceutical industry. Um, I, I'm equipped to, my, my goal in the slides that I'll present today is to help equip you to understand better and consume um, in a more informed way the volumes of information that are available. Uh, because I'm a biologist, I'm, I'm gonna have my words mostly centered around the basic biology of the virus. Although uh, I have done my best to um, equip myself to maybe speak on uh, some, some, other, some other things. I know there are a lot of questions that many of us have about um, you know, topics like the variants and uh, issues relating to the efficacy of uh, the vaccines against the variants and, and such. As I said, starting with the biology, this is a uh, 3D rendering of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, it's a scary looking thing. Um, and for anyone, I'm, I'm sure we've all seen pictures of or depictions of this virus. Uh, one of the most striking things that stands out to me and probably to most people um, are these, these studs that stick out from the surface of the virus. And um, these studs are called the spike protein. Uh, I wanted to introduce the spike protein right at the front because it is a critical piece of the virus. Um, it's critical for the virus to be able to enter cells. Um, and because of that, uh, it is a, a central target when, when we're talking about ways that we can intervene against um, the viral entry and replication. And that's what we're trying to do when we uh, develop vaccines against uh, the SARS-CoV-2. This is the viral life cycle of SARS-CoV-2. And I'm not, gonna, I, I'm, I'm not gonna go through every step and I don't think there's a need to go through every step here. I've, I've simplified it somewhat um, into three basic steps that I'd like for you to understand about the virus and its life cycle. Um, in step one on the left there, uh, this is a critical step. This is the step where the virus engages or encounters the, the cell. And this, this cell can be a, a cell um, in, your, in your airways, in your lung, um, or, or other places, maybe in your eye, but um, places where the virus enters the body. The virus uh, encounters the cell and using the spike protein, the virus binds to uh, portions of the cell uh, at the surface of the cell called receptors. Um, and there's a specific receptor called ACE2 that the virus binds to. And through that process, you can see depicted here, the virus um, is engulfed into the cell. And then a lot of stuff happens inside the cell, but we've, I've grouped all that into step two, which is basically that the virus makes many copies of itself. Um, it takes over your cellular machinery and replicates itself. And then we go to step three, where the virus is released. And the only thing sort of lacking in this uh, depiction here is that um, there's many, many viruses that are released in, um, at this point. It, it's not just uh, one in, one out. There's uh, many, many viruses. And in the process, uh, your, the, cell is, 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 the cell dies, the cell is killed in this process. So at this point, I'd like to introduce the, the immune system. Um, uh, I'm not an immunologist, but I, I can give you the basics of the immune system. And what we need to know, what we need to know for the purposes of this discussion is that um, the immune system, at least a portion of the immune system protects you by remembering pathogens, whether it be viruses or bacteria or parasites, the immune system, a significant um, a piece of it protects you by remembering pathogens that it has seen before. 
Um, so your immune system may see a pathogen one time, a virus um, may get you know pretty sick, uh, but the next time we see that virus, the immune system uh, has a memory, so to speak, of that virus and is able to mount an attack against the virus uh, and, and hopefully can uh, prevent you from getting really, really sick. Um, this is the adaptive immunity that I have uh, listed below. Um, the adaptive immunity takes some measure of time to kick, kick into place. Um, there are a lot of different pieces to the, the process that have to occur. And so um, there's time required for this process. And this is something that, that we'll come back to later um, when talking about the vaccines. And on, on, on the right-hand side, this is a depiction. This could be depicted a, a few different ways, but this is showing um, one, one piece of the biology of the immune system. But the main uh, point here is that when you get multiple exposures to uh, a pathogen, um, multiple exposures give you better uh, protection. So you might get exposed once and have X, X amount of protection, but if you come in and get re-exposed, then that'll take you up to another level of protection. And this underlies something we'll talk about later um, in the discussion, uh, why some of the vaccines require two doses. And so back to the spike protein, um, basically told you the spike protein is a, essential for the virus to be able to engage the target cell and to be able to enter the cell. So you might imagine that if you can intervene and come up with something that can attack that, uh, that spike protein and prevent the virus from being able to use the spike protein to enter the cell, um, that that would have some benefit in being able to prevent uh, the virus or some significant number of the viruses from being able to engage your cells and, and come in and replicate. So the vaccines, there's multiple types of vaccines um, that, that are available. Um, you guys have heard uh, all about them, I'm sure. The mRNA vaccines are, um, uh, represent one class of vaccines, but that's not, the, that's not the only class of vaccines. Fundamentally, what are these vaccines? These vaccines are ways to expose your body to the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus without having to be exposed to the whole virus, okay? So it's a way of tricking your immune system into thinking that you've been infected with the virus, but you actually have not been infected with the virus. You've just been infected with the spike protein. And one of the key things that you really need to understand about the different classes of virus or the different classes of vaccine, sorry, um, are that they're just different ways of uh, providing this spike protein to your immune system or presenting this spike protein to your immune system. So in one way, the whole pathogen way, um, that, is, that is a type of vaccine class where um, you're presented with the, the, uh, an attenuated or a weakened version of the virus itself. Um, so it's, it's the virus, but it's, it's a very weak version that's not gonna make you sick. And, you know, it'll give you an immune response as though it were the real virus. Um, what the, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines um, really are, are different than that in that the mRNA virus, the mRNA vaccines basically take the genetic sequence for the spike protein and directly introduce that genetic sequence into, into your body. And Basically, we use, or the vaccines use your body to uh, decode that mRNA sequence and produce the spike protein itself. So your body is actually making the spike protein of the virus. And then your immune system recognizes this as foreign because it's never seen it before and elicits an immune response. So that's, that's the mRNA vaccines. Um, there are other more traditional forms of vaccines where you're actually just taking the spike protein and injecting that, um, and those, those work um, just as well. But the bottom line is that these are just different ways to present pieces of the virus, in this case, the spike protein, to, um, to the immune system. I just described this basically, so I'll just recap saying the mRNA vaccines um, basically take the mRNA, put it into your body through injection, and then rely on your body and your cells uh, to make the spike protein and present it uh, to the immune system. And it works basically, uh, you know, the end result is basically the same as injecting the spike protein itself. 
but there are some advantages that we can get into in the panel discussion. Um, the different vaccines, again, they all sort of, uh, the, in, in this case, these are both mRNA vaccines, but again, all the vaccines sort of work in a similar way, ultimately in um, making spike protein or presenting spike protein to your immune system. Um, you know, the, all the vaccines, the bottom line is, uh, from this slide, they're all very effective. They're, they're all very effective vaccines. Um, there's, there are some differences in the numbers, different studies, um, but I, where it all nets out is that the differences between these vaccines are quite minimal um, and they've, they have really phenomenal um, effectiveness. As someone who's worked in the industry not doing vaccines, but um, who engages with a lot of uh, you know, colleagues in industry, I can tell you that people in the industry are quite proud of uh, you know, what, what um, has been achieved with these vaccines. I'll wind it out with a little comment about variants and then um, uh, allow us to move into the uh, remainder of the discussion. Um, variants are obviously something of, of great interest. You guys hear about them on the news all the time. Um, this is what we need to know about the variants. The, um, the, this is a depiction of bat cells. The, the virus is thought to have originated in bats. And this is a, uh, the purple is a receptor in bat cells. And the red is the spike protein of the original virus. Um, at some point, the, the virus jumped from uh, the bats and made its way into human cells. And the human cells have different receptors. So you can see that the spike protein doesn't quite fit the human receptors as well. And so initially that, that virus was not capable of transmitting as easily in humans because the, uh, the receptor didn't quite fit the spike protein as well. But over time and passing through a lot of different people and replicating a lot, uh, the virus is able to evolve. And eventually uh, you can get to a point where the virus has uh, evolved in different ways and generated different variants. And effectively what's happening is over time, the spike protein is adapting to the human cells. So the spike protein fits the human receptors better. And so that's what, what these variants are really. They're, they're a natural process of evolution of the virus that's allowing the virus to spread more easily and infect cells more easily. The implications, and we'll discuss this, the impl some of the implications about the variants. Um, what do we care about? Okay, we care about how do these variants impact how well the vaccines are going to work? Okay, and um, I'll just illustrate here conceptually one of the key things about the issue of variants and vaccines. Um, one major reason why some people avoid flu shots and other vaccinations is due to the side effects of flu-like symptoms like fever, chills, tiredness, and headaches. Why, are the, why do these side effects occur and is it to be expected? How long might it last? Can you speak to that very quickly? Sure. Um... I, I was thinking about this a little bit earlier and, and, you know, I wonder if side effect is even the right term to use because these side effects that happen as a consequence in some people of vaccines are, are really the expected effects. These are the effects of your immune system working, right? Like when you get infected with the flu or other viruses, you have symptoms and those symptoms really are, are not the viruses themselves per se, but really it's your response. So um, when you have a, when you have side effects from the vaccines, this is good. This is a good thing. It doesn't feel good, um, but this is a demonstration that the vaccine is is really working and doing what it's supposed to do. Um, my, my understanding is that, in for the most part, these these effects subside uh, over the course of a few days. But um, you know, I, I I think if if you think about them in their true context and about what they really are, that they're really effects of uh, you know showing in in. The work that I do, I'm, I'm what's called the biomarker discovery scientist. This is what you call a pharmacodynamic effect. This is, this is an effect that demonstrates that the drug is doing what it's supposed to do. 
So excellent. So, so vaccines trigger the innate response. Uh, you bring in all your B cells and macrophages, um, and, and they then help to produce antibodies so that the adaptive response later on can quickly identify, um, you know, that, that uh, foreign antigen if it becomes present again. So let's talk about the next step of this, which is, you know, some people erroneously assume immunity is instantaneous after receiving their uh, immunization shot or their vaccine. How long in actuality does it take to achieve achieve full protection after vaccination and what precautions should they take while their body builds immunity? So you all may recall uh, the, the slide that I had showing uh, the immune system, the innate and adaptive immune system. And you don't need to remember much of what was on that slide, except there, there were a lot of different things happening. Um, and it takes time for those things to happen. It takes time for the cell to, to um, in, in some cases, start changing the different expression of different genes involved in the immune in the immune system to for certain types of cells to divide and expand um, and secrete antibodies. These are processes that can take um, that can take a few weeks. Uh, and so the the critical point there to understand with regard to the vaccines, I think, is just because you've gotten the shot in your arm does not mean that you are protected at that point. Um, you really need to be mindful of the biology and how it works and that it does take time. These, these things are very effective, but it takes time for these biological processes to happen. Let's get into safety and efficacy because I think that sits on the top of everybody's mind. Um, and this question is for you, Dr. Roberts. Um, while all three vaccines have cleared phase three clinical trials with relatively large sample sizes, Pfizer and Moderna have been in distribution for several months now. What have uh, those of you in the, in the clinical space observed in terms of adverse reactions in the field? And what should people expect when they get vaccinated? Yeah, so great question. So Dr. Satterfield mentioned earlier about side effects, and I really appreciate his comments that I don't like calling them side effects. They're really just the response. That's what you expect to have when you get a vaccine. Um, so right. those are the responses. Let's talk about the adverse events. And those are the events that we don't necessarily expect to see. Um, and they're kind of one-offs. We see a handful of people doing it. Um, at my department um, here in Columbus, Ohio, we vaccinated thus far about 40,000, well, we've given 40,000 shots. Um, and uh, we are aware of two adverse events out of the 40,000 shots that we've given. Um, one, um, both of them were involved in anaphylactic reactions. And one of the individuals had had a history of anaphylactic reactions to other medications. Um, so that's what we've observed in our um, N of 40,000 shots. Um, but, you know, there have been some really other ones, but we have adverse events in all vaccines. It's not just this one. We've had them with flu, we have them with shingles, we have them with MMMR. Um, so adverse events are not completely unusual. And the CDC has a reporting system for that called VAERS, which stands for Vaccine Adverse Event Response and uh, Reporting, sorry, not response, reporting. And every vaccine provider has to report any adverse events they've seen in a patient they've given any vaccine to. So the CDC will be collecting that information for us um, and we'll be able to share that with all of us. Um, it'll be public information. Right, and now we've had millions and millions of, of individuals. So you would have at least been able to see a rare event by now, right? Co correct, absolutely. Right. Okay, so sorry to keep you on the spot, but got a follow-up question for you. Now we're getting into some really good meat here. Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are two-dose regimens, while J&J &J has a single-dose strategy. Are there any medical advantages to either one of the strategies? And should our colleagues or, or, or folks in the audience have a preference for one over the other? So no and no. Um, all of the vaccines are effective in preventing deaths and preventing hospitalization. And that's what we all have to understand. They're all effective and equally effective at preventing death, so mortality, and severe morbidity, so hospitalization from COVID-19. Um, if you are offered a vaccine, you should take the vaccine that is offered to you. Um, that's the best vaccine for you. Um, and I will tell you the Johnson & Johnson vaccine Although some people have said, well, it's less effective, it's not in the 90% effective range like the Pfizer and Moderna. Um, but also, I will tell you that the Johnson & Johnson had more people 
in their clinical trials. If I'm not mistaken, Pfizer had 37,000 and Moderna had about 30,000. Johnson & Johnson had 70,000 in their clinical trials. So they had more people to, so they had more data to study. And their clinical trials were also being conducted while we had variants circulating. So right. if right. we had, yeah, and that's an important point for people to understand. Right. That, that it's an apples trial, and orange comparison. It's an apples correct. and orange comparison in that regard. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So really quickly, um, with the two dose regimen, why is it important to have both doses? And is it wise to mix and match vaccine manufacturers if one is unable to schedule their second dose in that 21 to 27 day period? Sure. So for the Pfizer vaccine, it's 21 days, Moderna's 28 days, and you don't get full protection until you get that second dose. And then again, it's 10 to 14 days after that second dose. So it's not wise to skip the second dose or unless you have some medical reasons that you can't get the second dose. For example, you have anaphylactic reaction after the first dose. Um, it is also not recommended that you mix and match. If you got the Pfizer vaccine, and you go someplace different to get your next vaccine and they only have the Moderna, that is not recommended. Um, that's not to say that it hasn't happened and people haven't mistakenly received the wrong vaccine, um, but that is not recommended. And that's not what the studies show. The studies were not done on mixing and matching. The studies were done on getting the same product for both doses. Some immunologists have posed whether the spike protein uh, can induce the immune response and that can lead to autoimmune diseases, particularly in individuals who are susceptible um, and, that, um, and that some reactions may not manifest until several months or years later. Um, anyone want to care to comment on that and if there's any information we know about that? I'll, I'll speak a, a, a little bit from, from just what I know of biology and autoimmune uh, disease. Um, so, you know, sometimes it can happen that um, you, you get exposed to something um, and, and, you, and, and that something elicits an autoimmune response in you. Where, that, where that's best understood, usually that's a situation in which um, the thing that you've been exposed to, whether some sort of parasite or something else, uh, has a protein that looks really, really similar to a human protein. So it's what we call homology. Um, and so, but it's, it's different enough where you get an immune response to that parasite protein or whatever. Um, and at some frequency, maybe those antibodies that you elicited to the parasite protein will now turn on yourself. I haven't looked into it extensively, but I'm not aware of any homology between these spike proteins and any what we call endogenous human proteins or your natural human proteins. Um, but you know, it 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 could be. I, I think formally, it's one of these things that we'll have to have to wait and see. But uh, you know, from my understanding of the homology and the structure of the spike protein, I don't see anything that makes me say, "Oh, you know, that looks just like this other human protein." It makes me nervous. I don't. I don't see that. Thank you so much to you and Dr. Satterfield for all of your comments. I think that brings our COVID-19 panel to a close. I'd like to thank you and uh, Dr. Roberts and Dr. Satterfield for a really informative um, and uh, honest, transparent discussion. And thank you to the audience for joining the session. 